DNA-based tests like Ancestry.com and 23andMe have become so popular because we are all intrigued by the possibility of gaining some new insight into who we are or where we come from. However, while DNA testing is relatively new, the questions it seeks to answer are not new. People have always been interested in their lineage. In fact, did you know that there's another theory out there that says you can discover your ancestry in a much simpler way just by looking down at your feet? There are some who believe that the shape of your feet, or more specifically, the line of your toes, is the simplest way to discover the truth about your ancient lineage. So if everyone would please just take off your shoes and your socks, and if you could help your neighbor if you're with somebody right now, just kidding, do not do that. Please, everybody, remain shooed. However, while some cultures have looked to the natural shape of their feet to learn more about their identity, others have actually taken to the brutal practice of something called foot binding, attempting to literally shape their feet and shape their identity. Beginning in the 12th century in parts of China, the ultimate status symbol for a woman was small feet. And foot binding was an excruciating process of breaking and then tightly wrapping the broken feet in an attempt to make the foot smaller. I'll spare you the photos of this horrific practice, but just to give you an idea of how extreme it was, here's a picture of a pair of shoes from a woman who had her foot bound. Can you say, ouch? I mean, I can't imagine how painful this process would have been. And I know for us, it's, it's hard to even imagine this today, but at the time, many women were forced into this crippling form of conformity to guarantee their acceptance and their prominence among their peers. Thankfully, foot binding is no longer practiced in our modern world, but the truth is we still face enormous pressures to conform our bodies and our behavior to the patterns and expectations of our society. Many of us crave popularity. We want people to like us. And sometimes we seem addicted to what other people think of us. And why is that? Well, maybe it's because we received too little affirmation growing up. We had a void of being praised or complimented when we were younger. So as adults, we crave what we should have been given as kids. Or perhaps we become addicted to what other people think of us because we actually received too much empty affirmation growing up. We received so much affirmation and praise that we never really developed a sense of self-efficacy or self-worth apart from what others think of us. Or maybe we just developed an overdependence through this overuse of social media or some other habit or practice in our lives. But regardless of how we may have arrived here, I think that it's safe to say that most of us place a high value on what other people think about us perhaps far higher than we even realize. Consciously or subconsciously, many of us believe that our value as a person is based on how other people see us and what they think about us. And because of that, it affects the way we say or don't say in conversations. It affects the career we pursue. It, it affects what schools we send our kids to. It affects what we buy, who we date, how honest we are in our relationships. We are constantly being pressured to live in ways that can run contrary to the fullness of life that God intends for each of us. Our souls are being bound, constrained and deformed by a world and a culture that is often at odds with our flourishing. In fact, I believe the way we live, the way we think, and the way we interact with others serves to either bind or unbind our souls. And behind all this pressure is a powerful lie that I'm afraid all of us are susceptible to. It is a lie that often powerfully pressures us to conform. It's the lie of popularity. Today, we're going to be wrapping up our current series called Know Thyself. It is a series about confronting lies that keep us from recognizing our true identity. Our true identity is found in being a beloved child of God and discovering the unique vision and calling and mission God has given each and every one of us. Anything else that we let define us does not tell us the truth about who we are. 
You see, when we find our way back to God, we enter into a new relationship with him. And God declares that you are his beloved child, his beloved son, or his beloved daughter. That is your true identity. That is your true status. He says to you and to me, to all of us, you are my child. I love you. I am pleased with you. But we have such a hard time grasping that, don't we? We have such a hard time living into that truth. Instead, we fall for lies that tell us a different story, a totally different story about who we are and our purpose in this world. Lie number one that we tend to believe is the performance lie. It's the lie that says, I am what I do. Lie number two is the possession lie. It's the lie that says, I am what I have. And today, we're going to look at lie number three, the popularity lie. This is the lie that says, I am what others think. Throughout this series, we've been looking at a story from Luke chapter four about Jesus and temptation. So if you missed a week, let me catch you up to speed. Jesus is just starting his public ministry. And up until this point, his 30-year-old life, he's lived in relative obscurity. No one knows who he is. He hasn't accomplished much. And he's got a whole world to save. Jesus' public ministry begins when John baptizes him in the Jordan River. And as he comes up out of the water, the voice of God the Father declares, You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. God declares Jesus' true identity in this moment. And on the heels of this moment, on the heels of his baptism, Jesus goes out into the desert for 40 days to fast and to pray. And that is where the devil decides to try his hand at tempting Jesus. He tempts Jesus first with the performance lie, then with the possession lie. And the third temptation, the one we're going to look at today, starts like this. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Jesus is taken to the temple in Jerusalem, probably what was known as the royal porch on the temple's southeast corner. It loomed over a cliff and valley some 450 feet below. The historian Josephus mentions that just looking over the edge made people dizzy. So the evil one takes Jesus to this dizzying height, and then he says this, If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. If you are the Son of God, he says. Remember, God has just declared that Jesus is his beloved Son, but Satan is challenging Jesus right here in this moment to prove it. It's as if he says to Jesus, if you're really the son of God, why aren't you doing anything impressive? Why not do something to amaze the crowd? Prove to people who you really are by doing something spectacular. The core behind this temptation is this. Satan is trying to get Jesus to move away from his trust in his father's acceptance to attempt to earn acceptance on his own. Essentially, that is the force behind the popularity lie, that God's opinion isn't enough, that there must be someone else out there who can better validate our own worth, that we need approval from somebody else, somebody other than God. Now remember, at this point in Jesus's ministry, there's really been no healings, there's been no big teaching moments, no miracles. I mean, surely jumping off the highest point of the temple in front of a crowd would jumpstart him to stardom, wouldn't it? If people heard about Jesus pulling a stunt off Jerusalem's version of the Sears Tower, who wouldn't want to follow him? But that's not what Jesus chooses. He doesn't fall for the popularity lie. Instead, Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus refuses to test God. But what does it really mean to test God? Well, to test God is to display a lack of trust. For Jesus to test God in this moment would mean to waver in his trust of the father who called him beloved son, and instead try to prove his worth by impressing people, by impressing the crowd. 
If we're going to break out of the soul and life-binding pressures of the popularity lie, we'll need to wrestle with two really important yet difficult questions. The first question is this. Whose opinion is going to matter most? Is it God's? Is it the Father who calls you his beloved child? Or is it a person or, or people that you're trying to impress? We're all tempted to do that all the time, aren't we? Often our temptations are centered around chasing that sort of quick approval of people rather than relying on the long, steady acceptance of God the Father. That's why employees are, are tempted to overwork. Work. That's why students are tempted to overdrink. That's why we fill our social media feeds with pictures at restaurants or concerts or, or beautiful vacation spots. That's why parents maybe exaggerate the accomplishments of their children. That's why we may say something online or in a moment that we will later regret. When the voice of God that calls us his beloved child seems so soft as it often does compared to the voices of the people standing around us, we knowingly or unknowingly set out to impress these other people, to be someone they will notice, to be someone they will value. The devil says, jump, and we jump. Ever find yourself tempted to do that? Ever find yourself tempted to make choices based on what other people think and to take action in order to impress them? Of course you do. Of course you're tempted to do that. I'm tempted to do that. We're all tempted to do that. We're all human. And it's important that we recognize that Jesus was tempted to do it as well because he was fully human. When the devil said jump, don't think for a moment that he wasn't tempted to jump. But think about this for a moment. What would have happened if he jumped? What was at stake in this temptation? If Jesus had jumped, he would have been living according to someone else's script for his life, not his father's. He would have traded the great purpose and the great vision of his life for this brief momentary glory. And that trade, that trade is the tragedy of the popularity lie. When we give in to the popularity lie, it keeps us from becoming who we were created to be. It derails us from living out God's true purpose and, and vision for our life. It binds us and it deforms our lives. In his letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul asked this, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. The popularity lie whispers to us, I am what others think. And it is in direct conflict, direct conflict with the voice of God that declares the truth about your identity. You are his child. You are more loved than you could ever imagine. And he is delighted in you. But when we choose to believe the popularity lie, we, we drown out that voice that calls us beloved, the voice that says we're already fully and completely accepted. And instead, we live a life that is constantly fluctuating between the approval of others and, and the disapproval of others. We're, we're bound and crippled by opinions. We're burdened and crumbling under the pressure to be popular. But on the other hand, when we're faithful, when we're faithful to our true selves as sons and as daughters of God, we can experience God's best for our lives. Jesus didn't live his life trying to impress others because he didn't need to. His heart was, was full with his father's love and acceptance. His approval was, was fully received before he even did one thing in his public ministry. He had nothing to prove. So whose opinion are you going to let matter most? If it is God's opinion, then there's a second question that we'll need to consider. Question number two is this, who do I need to risk disappointing? Now, I know that, that most of you are probably not very excited about this one. What a downer, right? I mean, go out and disappoint people. 
But I also know that some of us are probably thinking, hey, disappoint people? Finally, a spiritual practice that I can excel at. But seriously, this is a reality that we do need to be aware of. If we decide that God's opinion is going to matter the most, we're going to end up disappointing some people. In choosing God's approval over the approval of others, Jesus disappointed all sorts of people. He disappointed his own family, who thought he'd gone crazy. He disappointed the people in his hometown. They wanted to push him off a cliff. He disappointed the religious leaders by not falling in line with their theology or ideology. He disappointed the crowds who wanted a Messiah that would conquer their Roman oppressors. See, when we stop performing to earn the approval of others, we'll likely face the same reality. We will disappoint some people as we choose to live out God's purpose and vision for our lives. Perhaps you already have some people that come to mind for you as you think about this question. See, we need to understand that it's not that person or group of people's responsibility to break the popularity lie in our life. It's ours. It's yours. It's mine. We are the ones who believe the lie that we are what other people think. We are the ones who are valuing their opinion more than the voice of the one who calls us my beloved child. Who do you need to risk disappointing in order to become the person God created you to be? Throughout this series, we've shared this quote from St. Augustine that has inspired the title of our series. Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I might know thee. Augustine was a leader in the ancient church who wrote his memoir, The Confessions, in 400 AD. And he wrote it about how he found his way back to God. And his story is really pretty incredible. Augustine was born into a religious home, but quickly wandered away. He found himself chasing knowledge and chasing women, but mostly chasing success and sort of public adoration. He was trained as a public speaker and eventually was so successful that he climbed the ranks of prestige until he became the speechwriter of the emperor himself. Yet, inevitably for Augustine, as can often be true, the more successful he was, the more empty he he felt. He had friends. He had fame. He had success. His popularity had never been greater, and yet he was miserably depressed because as he looked around, he realized he had spent his whole life conforming to the pressures of others. He was bound by them, and he never really asked who he truly was or, or who he was really meant to be. He was at a crisis point personally, a crisis point professionally, and a crisis point spiritually. He was hungry for God, and yet he realized his chasing of success was really just just empty, restless. It was a quest that would never really satisfy him. And in his book, The Confessions, it all comes to this head, this, this one great culminating moment where Augustine realizes that if he's ever going to be free from the pressures of the world, he's going to have to give his life to God. And it is at this very point in his telling that he asks himself this question, how can you draw close to God when you are far from your own self? And then he prays the prayer that inspired the title of our series, Grant, Lord, that I might know myself, that I might know thee. You see, the problem with the live prop popularity is that it tells you, if you just become like that, then finally you'll be loved. If you just do enough, if you just work enough, if you just make enough, if you just impress enough. However, the reality for any of us, just like Augustine, any of us who have chased after the popularity lies, that if you keep conforming to who other people want you to be, eventually you'll realize that that you don't even really know who you are anymore. You become something else, something other. But if you know who you are, if you know you are God's child, that you are loved, that you are secure, the binding pressures of popularity can be released. You don't have to impress if you're already completely accepted. You don't have to achieve if your identity as a child of God has already been given to you. 
You don't have to fear if you're already fully known and deeply loved just as you are. As I reflect on the lies of popularity, I've got to be honest with you and say that I've really struggled with this at one point or another throughout my life. Now, as I get older, I feel less of the pressure to fit into a particular crowd or group, but I still feel the power of this lie creeping into my heart and my mind in different ways. As a public leader and uh, speaker, what I believe and what I do and say are sometimes, well, public. And sometimes people will let me know that they disagree with me or wish I had done something differently or they express disappointment or even anger. So while it's true that I now feel a little less pressure to conform to a particular group, I still find myself being affected or, or disproportionately focusing on these moments when I feel like I've disappointed someone or, or let them down which is really just the flip side of the same old popularity lie popping its ugly head up again. Now, I'm not saying that we should be some kind of robot who feels nothing when something like this happens. That's not healthy, and that's not an unbound life either. But what I am saying is this. The more we grow in our trust that the most important part of our identity is secure as a child of God, the more we will find rest and peace in these moments of pressure to conform and the pain of disappointment. And the more we'll be able to release our fears, the more we'll be able to release our anxieties to the one whose love for us is eternal and unchanging. Now, it won't necessarily remove the pressures or the pains, but it will right-size them. It will keep them from binding and deforming our minds and our hearts and our souls. In Romans 12, 2, the Apostle Paul encourages us with this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, let me tell you why this is such incredibly good news. When we follow Jesus, the one who perfectly resisted the popularity lie, we no longer need to conform to the pressures around us. We no longer need to be bound by the opinions of others. We're actually freed by the renewing of our minds. The anxiety and fear that we carry can be unbound because we no longer have to be afraid of letting others down. Instead, we can trust and rest in our heavenly Father and in the Son whom He sent for us. I want to experience more of that kind of renewal in my mind, in my heart, in my soul, in my life. And I want that kind of renewal for you as well. So let's live in the truth of our belovedness and allow God to unbind us from the popularity lie. It's time to be transformed. It's time to be free.